I'm going to go through every single equation that you come across for A-level physics. So I'm going to be going in the order that the equations are found on the AQA formula sheet, but I will be adding in the equations not found on there from OCR and Edexcel as well. Sadly, I can't show you it on screen because AQA will copy strike me like they have done in the past. By the way, I've made videos talking about all of these equations, where they come from, how they're applied. If you want to go into more depth with them, then search my channel and you'll find a video on them. So let's start off with photons and energy levels. So first things first, we have the energy of a photon and that's given by E equals HF, where H is Planck's constant and you're given that 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. And of course, F is the frequency in Hertz. But because of the wave equation, we also know that if we don't have the frequency, but we do have the wavelength, we can replace the frequency with C over lambda, that is the speed of light over the wavelength. Photoelectric effect, we know that when a photon goes into a piece of metal, it's absorbed by an electron. And if it has enough energy, then it can liberate the electron from the surface. People get confused with this one. Maybe it would help if we rewrote it the way that AQA do it. They write it HF equals phi plus EK max. So what's going on here? We know from the above equation, that is just the energy of a photon that's coming into the piece of metal. I'm just gonna write energy of gamma because gamma is the general symbol for a photon. Phi is the work function, and that is again an energy. HF is energy in joules, work function is energy in joules. That's the energy required to liberate an electron. It's almost the toll, as it were, the energy toll that the photon needs to pay before it can liberate an electron. And so that means that EK max is the energy the electron has that's left over from after it's escaped. We're given one that's dedicated for energy levels. It's not really that useful, this one. It's not something you should have to look up. It just says that HF is equal to E1 minus E2. All this is saying is that when we have our energy levels, so let's say that's N1 and 2 and 3. All this is saying when a photon comes in, it can excite an electron up to a higher energy level. So the energy of the photon going in has to be the same as the difference between the two energy levels, that's all. What is important though is the de Broglie or de Broglie wavelength equation. This goes for any particle. We know that lambda is wavelength, we know that H is Planck's constant, so all we have left is P and MV. We know that both of those mean momentum. Sometimes you might see this called the AKA, the matter wavelength equation, because any particle can have a wavelength. It can act like a wave, but we do that especially for electrons. Okay, let's go for waves next. The wave equation is simply C equals F lambda. I prefer V equals F lambda. I don't know why. I think it's because I usually use C for just the speed of light, but some people use it for the speed of a wave. But I use V because it's useful to remember that it is a speed ultimately. We know time period of a wave is given by the reciprocal of the frequency. One divided by time period gives us frequency, therefore the opposite is also true. So whenever you're given a time period, you probably know that you're gonna have to turn that into a frequency or you can pop it just straight back into the wave equation there. So you end up with lambda divided by the time period. You have the first harmonic equation for a wave that's on a piece of string. And of course, what does that look like? The first harmonic just looks like this. It's just one loop. And the equation is the frequency is equal to one over two times the length of the piece of string times by the square root of the tension divided by the mass per unit length. Let's just write that down. This is the tension. Quite often, this is equal to the weight that is pulling on the piece of string. Usually you have a pulley and then you have weights hanging down here, don't you? So quite often we replace that with mg, and this is mass per unit length. In other words, kilograms per meter. Now it is worth remembering, we have 2L here, so that's effectively wavelength, because two lengths of the piece of string gives us one full wavelength, because you have half wavelength on the piece of string there for the first harmonic. So therefore, if you pop this over the other side, we end up with lambda times frequency. Therefore, what does that mean? Square root of tension divided by mu is, that is actually our speed. So if you just want the speed of a wave on a piece of string, you just need to do 
square root of tension divided by mu. Here we have Young's double slit or the fringe spacing equation, all to do with diffraction, fraction pattern equation, whatever you want to call it. Here we have W equals lambda D over S. This is our fringe width. Now we know that's fringe spacing, but W width, so fringe width, that makes it slightly easier to remember. Lambda, of course, is the wavelength. D, it's a big D, so that means that that's our big distance. Big distance. So that's our slit to screen distance. We have S, that's our slit separation, the small distance between our double slit. All of these are in meters, so it's just meters equals meters times meters divided by meters. Then we have our diffraction grating equation, which we know is very similar, but this is the proper equation as it were, whereas Young's double slit equation is somewhat an approximation. D sine theta is equal to N lambda where D is the grating spacing. In other words, how far apart are the slits in the grating? Sine theta, well, theta is just the angle of order. And when we say order, of course, we have like the laser there. And then we have our screen. Let's make it a curved screen, why not? We have our zeroth order there, first order either side. Then you can have your second order as well, can't you? So there we go. So the angle, of course, is the angle going from here to here, if we're looking at the first order, and then all the way across to the second order, whatever. N is our order, 0, 1, 2, 3, it's just an integer. Then lambda is our wavelength. Of course, quite often, grating spacing is given as lines per meter. So in order to find out meters from lines per meter, we do one divided by our lines per meter to give us the grating spacing. That's usually the way these questions go. So e.g., let's go with 200 lines per millimeter, turn that into 200,000 lines per meter, and then finally we do one divided by that. So that gives us five times 10 to the minus six meters for our grating spacing. We have our refraction equation, so refractive index first. We know that we can get it from n equals c over cs. Refractive index tells us how much slower light goes in a medium. So this is speed of light in a vacuum or air, we can just say that or whatever. And this is the speed of light in the medium. And we know that the top number is always going to be bigger. So therefore N is always going to be bigger than one. Light can't go faster than the speed of light. Well, as far as we know. Now, OCR give it kind of weird. I mean, they say C over V, which I kind of get. So V being the speed in the medium. They also give Snell's law kind of weirdly as well. Uh, they say N sine theta equals constant. Tell you what, let's just go for Snell's law. And whenever it comes to refraction, this is the one that I say that you should always use. N one sine theta one equals N two sine theta two. This of course is the refractive index our first material, or medium I should say. And then theta one is the angle of incidence, and then the two is the angle of refraction. Just make sure you get them the right way around. And you always start with this one, I would say. Even when it comes to things like critical angle, you still start off with Snell's law because they do give you an equation for the critical angle, but I don't know, it can cause a bit of confusion. So you can say sine theta c, where theta c is a critical angle, is equal to N2 over M1. You need to make sure you have those the right way around. If it was me though, I just always go with Snell's law and I would say, hey, if we're talking about critical angle, then of course we're talking about there's your line, or there's your boundary rather, then there's your ray going along there. We know there's on 90 degrees. So therefore, we know that for critical angle, this is 90. And so that means that the whole thing disappears. And then of course, this turns into theta c, if we're trying to find the critical angle. That's how I do it. Next, we have mechanics. Moment, or in other words, turning force is equal to F times D. Come with a caveat though. Yes, this is force, and this is distance to pivot. But we know that if we have, say, something like this, but then we have a force that's pushing at an angle, then of course, we need the components of the force that's perpendicular to the distance. Now, 
some people put it the other way around, but it's effectively the same thing. So the other way of putting it is it's actually the force times the distance that is perpendicular to the force's line of action. doesn't matter which way around you do it. Either way, you are going to be timesing by cos theta or sine theta, depending on which angle you have. But generally, it's cos theta because you're given the angle between the line that's perpendicular to the distance and the actual force. So it's usually times cos. Similarly, just jumping down a little bit, we also have work done and that is equal to FD as well. They like to put S, don't ask me why. I think as S is displacement, so we're actually moving something here. Work done is just energy, energy transferred by a force. This is distance moved, but once again, we could have a sledge being pulled along, but it's actually being pulled by somebody who's pulling it in this direction here. So it's not all of that force that is going to be used to pull it in the direction along the ground. I should probably put S there instead. So therefore we are going to times by cos theta again. So there should be a cos theta in that equation on your formula sheet. That's why that's there. We're given speed is equal to distance over time or rather velocity is equal to displacement over time. Easy peasy. Acceleration is equal to rate of change of velocity. So delta V over delta t. Worth remembering that this can be given just by v minus u over t. So the difference between the initial speed and the final speed divided by the time. And of course we've just stumbled across one of our equations of motion. So equations of motion v equals u plus a t. And that's effectively the same thing. We also have v squared equals u squared plus 2as. s equals u t plus half a t squared. We use this one a lot, fairly important, but usually u is zero. So quite often we get rid of ut because u is zero. And that's because if it wasn't zero, then we have t squared and t, and we'd have to crack out the quadratic formula and I've never come across a question that requires that. And s equals u plus v over two times by t. This is literally just speed equals distance over time. Same thing as average speed distance over time is just that. When do we use these? Well, we use these whenever there is acceleration. We only use if there is acceleration. If there isn't, then we just use speed equals distance over time. So in projectile motion, we don't use the horizontal components of the speeds, etc., but we do use it for the vertical. Probably the most important equation ever. I'll say that for a lot of equations, but whatever. We know that F is equal to MA. This is Newton's second law. This equation gets used a lot, of course, we know in year 12, but lots of people forget it in year 13. We need it all the time. We always need this one because we deal with gravitational fields, electric fields, magnetic fields in year 13, in second year physics. So that means we are going to have acceleration of particles. We need this equation. Funnily enough, we're not actually given an equation for momentum, but we're just given forces equal to change in mv divided by delta t. This is, of course, change in momentum because mv is momentum. This is the same thing as impulse. If you ask, what is the impulse? It's just change in mv. Quite often we'll get a graph of time against force and we've been asked to find the impulse and we know it's the area under the graph. This is equal to the impulse. And we know that from the equation because force times time gives us change in momentum. When it comes to this one as well, it's worth remembering that this can also be rewritten as F is equal to mass times a change in V divided by change in time. Of course, this is just acceleration, so we stumbled across Newton's second law again, but it can also be velocity times change in mass divided by change in time. Why would we use this? We use this version if we're dealing with, e.g., fluid through a pipe or conveyor belt of things, maybe coal, something like that. So we actually have a constant speed of the fluid or material going through or along something, but we're getting so many kilograms per second of this stuff being transferred through our pipe. Kinetic energy, we know, of course, we can write it as Ke or Ek, whatever, is equal to half mv squared. We know that one, hopefully. And we know that GPE, Gravitational potential energy, we can just call that EGP or something like that. We know it's equal to MGH. 
Now it technically should be delta H because, well, when do we actually have zero potential energy? Never really. So we should say change in that, whatever. We're not too concerned as long as we have that. However, we do not use in the gravitational fields topic because only good for constant field strength, constant field, constant G. As soon as G starts changing, we get further away from the Earth, so G actually has a meaningful change in it, then we need to switch our equation, don't we? Power, of course, is the rate of energy transferred. That's the same thing as joules per second. And then we have P equals FV as well. Sometimes we call this power developed. Don't ask me why, but this is basically the power version of work done equation. So if we write down the work done equation, we have, oh, fine, let's put S. If we divide by time on the left, we end up with power. If we divide by time on the right, we end up with speed. So therefore they are effectively the same equation, just divided by time on both sides. And then we know efficiency is equal to useful output. Now it could be energy or power. It could be joules or watts, doesn't matter. And of course, if you want to turn it into percentage, just times by a hundred. Materials, here we have density. It was given by rho mass divided by volume. So that's kilograms divided by meters cubed. So therefore that gives us kilograms per meter cubed. Fairly easy, but sometimes people forget that. Hooke's law for springs, F equals Kx or Ke or something like that, or K delta L. I prefer Kx. F is force, of course, delta L or X is our extension. And K is our spring constant or our stiffness. And we know that when we have a graph of force against extension, it's the gradient that gives us that. We can see that from the equation because force divided by x by extension gives us the spring constant. Let's go for Young modulus. We give it the symbol E. However, they haven't done that with the formula sheet here, but whatever, they've just given uh, the words. Don't ask me why. But this is generally what we do. We call E the Young modulus, and we call sigma the stress, and we call epsilon the strain. What are they? Stress is force per unit area, and we know that's also given by pascals, newtons per meter squared is pascals. Strain is change in length compared to original length, so extension divided by original length. Because if we put these into here, we end up with the whole equation, E, your modulus is equal to FL over A delta L. So that way we can see how everything affects how much something extends. Quite often you get questions that ask you how far does something extend? So therefore we want to find out how delta L is changing. So all we have to do is swap around those. So quite often we end up with delta L equals FL over A E. And we can turn that into a proportionality equation, blah, blah, blah. You haven't seen my proportionality video? Go watch it. Everybody's favorite, it's electricity. First things first, we know that current is rate of flow of charge. So we can say Q over T. Okay, you might see deltas in between. Doesn't really matter too much. Current is amps, but that's the same thing as coulombs per second. Q is charge in coulombs times seconds. Easy so far. Voltage or PD is, well, they've written W over Q there. I don't like that. I much prefer E. I hate it when they put W for work instead of energy, whatever. That's what I prefer because voltage is effectively energy. It's joules per coulomb. Yes, volts are the same thing as joules per coulomb. How many joules does every coulomb of charge gain or lose as they pass through something? Weirdly, they've given us Ohm's law like that, but of course, we know that Ohm's law is V equals IR. And all of electricity comes down to this one equation, really. If you're stuck on a question, guaranteed you're gonna have to use V equals IR somewhere, but you have to find out two of those things. And that's the difficult thing with electricity questions. It's not what equation you're gonna use, but how do you find out the missing variable? Of course, when we have a graph of V against I, could be I against V as well, doesn't matter. Tell you what, let's put it that way around. So that's usually the way you'll see it. It's not the gradient that gives you anything. Nope, 
if you want the resistance, you literally just take a point on the graph and then do voltage divided by or PD divided by current. That's what you do. Gradient does give you an idea of what's happened to the resistance, but it doesn't give you the resistance itself. Resistivity, resistivity, ugh. Rho, again, not density, but resistivity is equal to R A over L. Don't forget that the unit of this is ohm meters, not ohms per meter. R is resistance, A is area. Sometimes you'll be asked to give the definition of what resistivity is. And because people see ohm meters and they know there's an area in there and a length, quite often they'll say that it's the resistance of one meter cubed of a material. But that's not quite right because one meter cubed could be something like that. It could be something like that with the wires going through like that, wires going through like that, and that is going to change it. No, it needs to be a cube because we need an area of one meter squared and a length of one meter. So therefore that's our definition. Resistivity is the same thing as resistance of a one meter cube of that material. The only way that we can get that area of one meter squared on the length of one meter as well. You might want to say instead a cube of unit length sides. Resistance in series, well, you know, they just add up, don't we? So we can just say R total. It says RT on the NQA one, just add them up. And of course, if there's more than two, just add on the rest as well. We have resistors in parallel, a little bit trickier. R1, R2, of course, we could have R3 as well. One in parallel, like Christmas tree lights. So one over R total is equal to one over R1 plus one over R2, etc., etc. Shortcut, if identical, R total is halved. So for instance, if these were 30 ohms, 30 ohms, R total would be 15 ohms. Now, I would argue that you don't really need this equation either because what does it come down to? Well, it all comes down to what do I know to be true? When I know resistors are in series, I know that current is the same in both. However, what do we know is true for parallel? We know that V is the same for both and the current is shared. So if we know that the total current going through the two resistors is equal to the current going through one plus the current going through the other, then we know from Ohm's law, because V equals IR, we know that I is equal to V over R. So therefore, V over R total is equal to V over R1 plus V over R2. Of course, all the Vs are the same, so they disappear. We can divide and we end up with just ones. That's all that that equation is about. Electrical power, we have three equations for this. P is equal to VI, first of all, PD times current. But we know that if we stick V equals IR into either one of these, we end up with I squared R or V squared over R. Which one do we choose? Choose the one with a constant. So e.g. let's say you have resistance, I is constant for say two thingies. So let's say for two components, if I is constant, then of course we're probably looking at resistors that are in series. Then we're going to use this one here. EMF and internal resistance, EMF, EMF is equal to, oh, how interesting. They've now given us energy divided by charge as opposed to work divided by charge. But this is like, you know, hopefully this is just the same thing as voltage. It just happens to be voltage gained by charge or energy gained by charge as it's going through. So it's still joules per coulomb, but it's energy gained. Our equation for internal resistance, epsilon equals IR. Of course, we can factorize that, can't we? But let's think about what we have here first. This is just V total. It's just the total voltage available. This again is IR, so it has to be a V as well. This is V, the voltage of the circuit. Then this is the voltage lost in the battery. All it is is just voltage equal voltage plus voltage. And of course, we can factorize this. And lo and behold, it's just V equals IR yet again. Voltage is equal to current times resistance. That's all it is. It just so happens that we have two resistors in parallel, one of the resistors being the internal resistance. Just an extra one for OCR here. We have a drift velocity equation. So I, of course, is the current. A is the area of the wire. E, of course, is just the charge of an electron. 
n is the number density of the electrons. That's per meter squared. And then finally, v is our drift velocity. This just tells you how fast your electrons are actually going along the wire. It's a largely useless equation, if you ask me, because there's no benefit to knowing how fast electrons are going through a wire. All right, crossing the gap from year 12 to year 13. Circular motion, we have omega is equal to V over R. Or in other words, V equals omega R. That's how I get my students to remember it. It's an equation that people often forget, but it's very, very important, very, very useful. Where does it come from? Well, we know that this is radians per second. We have something go around in a circle. And of course, we know that its speed is equal to distance over time. Time being the time period, because that's the time it takes to go one full circle. What is the circumference? It's two pi r, so divided by t. We know that frequency is equal to one over time period, therefore speed is equal to two pi f r. This is omega, therefore v equals omega r. Very important equation. This is the link between rotational speed and linear speed. And that's one of our equations as well, just that omega is equal to two pi f. It's just the number of whole circles or whole waves per second times by two pi to give us radians per second. Easy. Now centripetal of force, f is equal to mv squared over r, mass velocity squared divided by the radius. However, if you replace the v with omega r's, we end up with m omega squared r. Which one do we choose? We choose the one on the left if we're looking for a linear speed or if we're looking for rotational speed or time period, especially if we're looking for time periods, we choose the one on the right instead. And of course we know that this is equal to two pi f, which is also equal to two pi over t. So you'll end up doing that a lot. You'll end up replacing omega with two pi over t to find the time period, or if you're given a time period. And one more thing about this, we know that because f is equal to ma, that means that v squared over r and also omega squared r are both equal to acceleration. So we don't need the mass if we're just looking for the acceleration. SHM, or simple harmonic motion. First equation is for acceleration. Acceleration is equal to minus omega squared x. The minus is in there, of course, because the definition for SHM is when we have acceleration is proportional to displacement, that is x, and in the opposite direction. And so this equation gives you the two conditions needed for SHM to occur. Then we have our equation that tells us what's actually happening to things undergoing SHM. A times cos, it could be sine as well, it depends on where the graph or whatever starts. It's cos if it starts at amplitude, and we use sine if starts at zero or equilibrium. Quite often we'll use this when we have a graph. And so if it's a graph that looks like that, this is time over here, this is our displacement. Of course, we can get our amplitude from the graph. We can get time period from the graph as well. We can use that. And of course we can see what the displacement is at any given time. In this case, we use sine because we're starting at equilibrium at time of zero. Given the equation for speed, and so we know that's v equals plus or minus omega times square root of amplitude squared minus where it is at that point, the displacement squared. Very unusual for you to have to use this equation. So I don't think I've ever seen it come up in a question in my 11 years of teaching. So I wouldn't worry too much about that one. The more important thing is that we know what the maximum speed is. V max, of course, is at equilibrium. And so when we have equilibrium, x is zero, so that disappears. And so we just end up with omega a. Max acceleration, of course, is at amplitude. It might be going the slowest at that point, but it is accelerating the quickest. So this is at amplitude, this is at equilibrium. Even though we're using the amplitude in the equation for max velocity, it's still happening at equilibrium. Pendulum, we have time period, it's given by this, where L is the length of the piece of string, G is field strength, or acceleration due to gravity, same thing. Mass spring, very similar, just swap out some letters. Important thing is that there's no mass in the top equation, so therefore would be the same whatever mass you use. And also here, there's no g, and so this would be the same regardless of where you did it, in space, on the moon, wherever. 
Okay, let's do some thermal physics. SHC, specific heat capacity. Q, heat. I like E, but whatever. MC delta theta. I prefer to write it as E equals MC delta T. Doesn't matter. Point is, is that this is our temperature. Theta is quite often used for that. C is just our specific heat capacity. M is mass, of course. Q is our energy put in or our heat. And that's just going to be in joules. So this, of course, is when we are heating or cooling a substance. No change of state. I mean, there might be, but we use another equation for that, of course. And that is our SLH equation, specific latent heat. Q is equal to ML. That's our latent heat or specific latent heat. This is joules per kilogram. Probably should put here as well that the unit for SHC is joules per kilogram per Kelvin or per degree C. Doesn't matter, same thing in this case, if we're talking about just a change. SHC, the definition is the energy required to raise a kilogram of a substance or unit mass of a substance by unit. Temperature change, specific latent heat. Definition is what well, is joules per kilogram, so it's the energy or heat required to change the state of unit mass. So this is changing state. Of course, we have two different SLHs for a material. We have the SLH of fusion, which is when it melts and freezes and then solidifies. And then we also have specific latent heat for vaporization as well. So that's turning into a gas or coming back down, condensing. Gas laws, the PV is equal to little n RT, and then also PV equals big N K T. These, of course, are the same. R and K are constants, but they're different constants for the job. So this is number of moles, but this is number of molecules. And so we change the constant depending on which one we're using. This is just the gas constant or the molar gas constant, 8.31. This is the Boltzmann constant. And we can see that we have our three laws in there as well. We can see that P is inversely proportional to volume because they're on the same side. So if you move volume over the other side, that is if the number of moles and temperature are staying constant. This is Boyle's law. Also have Charles's law, that is volume is proportional to temperature. And then we also have the pressure law, which is pressure is proportional to temperature. And quite often you'll be asked to find what's happening before and after with the gas. And so we need to build up an equation from there. So let's say we're using Boyle's law here. We put them on the same side. PV for before is equal to PV for afterwards. And so that's how we can find out our unknown, maybe before or afterwards. Of course, it could be lots of things that are changing. So it's just the number of moles that are staying the same. So we can see that PV is proportional to T. So therefore we can say that PV over T before is equal to PV over T afterwards. So you just got to rejig the formula depending on the situation. Kinetic theory, we can say that PV is also equal to a third Nm C squared or CRMS squared. That's just speed of the particles. So root mean square speed of the molecules. Something that people often get wrong, M is the mass of one molecule. Therefore, that means that N times M is the total mass of a gas. Don't get those two confused. Quite often people will say, oh, M is equal to so many kilograms because that's how much gas there is. No, NM is that. We can also rejig this. If we put volume over to the other side, we end up with, well, P is equal to a third NM over V times C squared. Total mass divided by volume. This is the same thing as density. So therefore we can say that pressure is also equal to a third times the density times C squared. We know the kinetic energy of one molecule is just going to be half mv squared, but we use C squared in this situation. If you pop that back into our equation above, we find that Ek is also equal to just three halves kt. Very, very important equation. If you know the temperature of a gas, you automatically know the average kinetic energy of the molecules within. Gravitational electric fields have a lovely way of organizing all of these equations. Force between two masses is equal to gmm over r squared. For electric fields, that's equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon qq over r squared. Now, epsilon zero is permittivity of free space, but it is a constant, so therefore we can just say the whole darn thing is a constant here, so we can replace that with just a k 
we can just make up our own. You won't see that in your formula sheet, but it's such a nifty little shortcut. Why? Because the two sig figs, K okay, is 9.0 times 10 to the nine. Such an easier number to deal with rather than faffing around with one over four pi epsilon zero. Permittivity of free space, just a constant. It just tells you how easy is it for an electric field to be set up in free space. Spoiler, it's fairly difficult because that's the hardest thing to set up a field in. This of course is Newton's law of gravitation, whereas this is Coulomb's law. And you will be asked to define these as well. So we can say gravitational or electrostatic force is proportional to, because when we define equations or laws, we don't involve constants. Say it in such a way that you could use any unit, it would still be true. Force is proportional to the product of masses or charges in the case of electric fields and inversely proportional to the square of their separation. Definition, you need to know back to front. Gravitational field strength is equal to just gm over r squared. We're just dropping the second m, and it's the same thing for electric field strength. Don't get confused if you use e for energy as well. These are always what force would you feel if you were in the field? So it's not actual force, it's newtons per coulomb, newtons per kilogram. Of course, we know that g can also be given as meters per second squared. It's also known as acceleration due to gravity. To get from field strength to force, all we have to do is either times by their second mass or second charge. Let's go the other way. Let's actually times by distance. If you take force and you times by distance, that's work done. So in other words, we can say that potential energy, I'm gonna write EP just to distinguish it from field strength, is equal to KQ just over R. Similarly, for gravitational potential energy, you're not actually given these as equations because you're expected to know that force times distance gives you energy. What you are given though are the equations for potential. I'm not going to go into lots of detail. If you want to go into lots of detail, have a look at my fields video on my channel. Definition for potential is the work or energy required to move unit mass from infinity to that point. And because we know for an attractive field, say we have a planet or whatever, infinity is out here, we actually need to put in energy to get it to infinity. So it's opposite day. So that's why we have a negative in there. We don't have a negative, no negative as Q is already negative in this situation. If it's going to be like a planet, it's attractive for a positive charge. And that's what we always think about when we look at electric fields, it's what would happen if you put a positive charge in the field. To go from here to here, all we have to do is times by that second charge or second mass. So that's why we can say that change in potential energy is equal to that second mass times the change in potential. Similar for electric fields, probably put little p's there, that second charge times the change in potential. Of course, we can go from here to here as well, can't we? We're just dividing by r. That's why we can say that both g and e are equal to change in potential over distance. So that's why we can call them both potential gradient just like contours on a map. The quicker the contour lines change, the steeper the hill, and so therefore the stronger force you'd feel. Now, of course, we know from just now that force is equal to field strength times Q. So in other words, Newtons is equal to Newtons per Coulomb times by Coulombs. Makes sense, doesn't it? So that's an equation you'll come across, one that people often forget as well though. For a parallel plate setup or a uniform electric field, we have our two plates like that. We can draw the air potentials between. The potentials are changing the same amount every centimeter, every meter, etc. They're changing uniformly. So therefore we can say that, well, we saw earlier that electric field strength is also known as potential gradient. So delta V over delta R, actually we can just say that that is just the voltage or PD across the two plates divided by the separation of the plates. So as soon as you see parallel plates, you know you're gonna to have to use this equation. Field strength is equal to V over D. Capacitors, well, the definition of capacitance is Coulomb stored per unit PD. And so that's therefore Coulombs per volt. And we know the unit for capacitance is farads. We can change the capacitance by changing the area. We know permittivity of free space comes into play, as does the relative permittivity of the dielectric that we have in between. So this is area, this is 
permittivity of free space. Don't get confused between permeability and permittivity. And this is our relative permittivity. This is just a number that is greater than one that we multiply the whole thing by. And that's because we have a dielectric in there. And this is the separation of the two plates of our capacitor. Energy stored in the capacitor, well, if we draw a graph, V and Q, we know that it's the area under the graph that gives us the energy. So that's equal to half QV. If we stick the capacitance equation instead of Q or V, we end up with either half CV squared. This is also equal to half Q squared over C. Which one do we choose? Well, similar to earlier, we choose one with a constant variable in. So you have a question where the battery is disconnected from the capacitor. That means that Q has to stay constant because charge can't leak from one plate to the other. But C is changing. Let's say we want to know what happens to the energy. Well, we're not going to choose this because the voltage is changing as well. So we don't really want that. We're going to use this one here. Q is constant, so we can take it out of there. We know how C is changing. We can find out how E is changing. Likewise, if the battery is still connected, that means that V stays constant because, of course, it's still hooked up to the battery. And then C is going to change as well. So we'd use another one then. It's going to be this one. Okay, we've got capacitor decay. So here we have Q. And how quite often you'll see them written like this. Q equals Q0 e to the minus t over rc. However, I don't like them written like that. What I do is put the q over the other side because this is just a game of ratios. This is just how much charge have we got left compared to the charge that we had at the beginning. So this is just a ratio. And therefore, that means that this is just a ratio too between 0 and 1. How much of an original amount do we have? Of course, this is also true for voltage and current as well. Yes, we can log both sides, can't we? So we can say that log Q over Q0 is equal to minus T over RC if we're looking for T, R or C. We are going to use natural log LN. I don't like calling it LN, but we're going to use that in this case because we have E, Euler's number. Now, if we're charging, then it's slightly different. So let's say this is, let's stick with charge, shall we? So this is time. It's going to charge like this, isn't it? So you want to know what the charge is there. Well, it's basically just the opposite of discharging. So we can just say that Q over Q0 is not going to be how much we have left, but how much has been added in. So because this is just a ratio game, we can just say it's equal to one. Take away e to the minus T over RC. That's all we're doing to make it the sort of opposite. Time constant. This is the time constant. This has to be a time because whatever goes above E, whatever power E is to, it has to have no units. So it has to be seconds divided by seconds. So that means RC has to be a time ultimately. If we have this, then that means that Q over Q0 or voltage, whatever, will be 0.37 or 37%. If you have the resistance and the capacitance of the circuit that we're discharging through or charging through, we know that when the time is equal to that, and so we have RC over RC as it were, we end up with e to the minus one, and that gives us a 0.37. So that's the magic number, 37%. That's what we'd have left if our time is equal to the time constant. If you want more detail, have a look at my capacitors video. Magnetic fields, first and foremost, we have F bill, F is force, B is flux density, magnetic flux density, I is current, of course, and L is length of wire. Therefore, that means that the unit of flux density can be given as, if we rearrange it, is the unit of F divided by I L. So that is the same thing as Newtons per amps per meter. Of course, we know that flux phi is given by B A. So that must mean that if flux has the unit Vibers, then that means that, well, if this is area, that flux density must have the unit Vibers per meter squared. So there's two units for flux density there, but we have one more. We also call it the Tesla. So flux density can be so many Tesla. Free moving charged particles, free charges, whatever you want to call it. We know that F is equal to B Q V. Flux density, charge, speed. And we know that they have to be perpendicular to each other. So B and V perpendicular. Flux linkage, well, People get confused about this. Flux linkage is just when we have more than one loop of wire actually capturing the flux. So we just have N, which is our number of turns in our coil. So if 
phi flux is equal to BA, then N phi is equal to BAN. That's all it is. Yes, they've added in a cos theta there as well. Faraday's law for induced EMF. EMF is equal to, yes, we can stick an N in there as well because we might have more than one turn. More importantly, delta phi by delta T. In other words, rate of change flux linkage. So that means that if we have a rotating coil or a generator, we can give that as just our maximum flux linkage. So that's just our max flux linkage. Let's just say times by omega. Now this will actually give us our max EMF. We actually might call that EMF zero, so epsilon zero. So that's our maximum. And then as it's rotating, then of course, we know it's just gonna be less than that. So then we just times by sine omega t or two pi ft. It's very, very similar to our SHM equation, just displacement equals amplitude times sine omega t. But in this case, it's not amplitude, it's maximum EMF. Alternating current, we know that IRMS, so the average current, if we have wibbly wobbly current, the conversion factor is root two. I0 is our peak current, V0 is our peak voltage. Actually, if we're looking for the equivalent power that is provided, we don't say PRMS, because it's not quite that. It's going to be IRMS times VRMS. And so that's actually I0 by root two times V0. So therefore that actually just gives us IV over two. So that's therefore equal to our peak power divided by two transformers when we have, you know, a transformer, two coils, blah, blah, blah. And so we can say the ratio of the turns is equal to the ratio of the voltages across the two. Efficiency, because they're never 100% efficient because of eddy currents, blah, blah, blah. We can just say that's equal to the power in the second coil divided by the power in the first coil. And so we know that's equal to VI for both. If we do say that it's 100% efficient, we can just say that VI equals VI and then go from there. Nuclear, we have the inverse square law, I is intensity. So intensity of radiation is often given as watts per meter squared. So that means it's power divided by area that that power is covering. However, it also works for not just power, but counts and amount of radiation hitting. So what we can actually say for the inverse square law is that intensity is equal to some constant K divided by the distance squared. So putting x squared over the other side, we can say that I1 x1 squared is equal to I2 x2 squared. Doesn't matter how we measure the I, that's always gonna be true. Radioactive decay, very important equation. A is equal to lambda N. Activity of radioactivity is equal to the decay constant times the number of radioactive or unstable nuclei left. And so similar to capacitors, we have N equals N zero, but I'm going to put the N zero over the other side, equals E to the minus lambda T this time. And that counts for activity. And it also counts for mass as well of unstable nuclei left. Of course, we can log both sides as per usual. So log over N zero is equal to minus lambda T. Like I said earlier, this can't have any units. So therefore, if T is seconds, that means that lambda must have the unit seconds to the minus one. What it is, it's the probability of a nucleus decaying in next second. I'm also given the half-life equation, T half. Half-life is equal to log, natural log of two over the decay constant. I talk you through where that comes from in the video. This is half-life. That's the time taken for half of the nuclei they have left to decay. Nuclear radius, R, that's the actual radius itself. R zero, that's just a constant times A to the third, where A is the number of nucleons in the nucleus. And whenever we have mass defects, we know that the change in energy is equal to the change in mass times the speed of light squared as per Einstein's equation. Okay, so that's it for the stuff that everybody has to do. Now I'm going to do some stuff that crops up in OCR and Edexcel as well. However, I'm not gonna be covering everything that's in the AQA optional modules because I feel there's just maybe a little bit too much there. First things first, the peak wavelength of radiation emitted by a star is inversely proportional to the temperature. So here we have 
So we have energy at the side and then our graph like that. It's this wavelength. And that is inversely proportional to the temperature. Then we have the luminosity equation. Luminosity is equal to 4 pi r squared, sigma t to the power of 4. Sigma is Stefan's constant, t is the temp, r is the radius, of course, of the star. 4 pi r squared is also the surface area of the star. L is luminosity, and that's in watts, and so it literally is just the total power of radiation emitted by a star. Top of the shift, redshift, we observe a change in wavelength, so that change to the normal wavelength is going to be the same thing as the change in frequency compared to original frequency. That's going to be approximately the same as recessional velocity divided by the speed of light. This can also just be called Z, just red shift or Doppler shift. That's just going to be a ratio. Hubble equation. So if we have a graph of recessional velocity against distance, we have this straight line. So we can infer that velocity is equal to some constant times D. Therefore, H0 is the Hubble constant. So that's equal to V over D. So that gives us something with the unit seconds to the minus one. Therefore, in theory, one over the Hubble constant gives you the age of the universe. And you also have the parallax equation. Parallax in arc seconds is equal to one divided by distance in parsecs. And just a little bit of medical physics to finish off only for OCR and AQA if you're doing the medical physics optional module. Mostly to do with ultrasound and x-rays. Acoustic impedance is equal to density of the material times the speed of the wave. An equation that tells us what happens to the intensity of a reflected wave at a boundary. And so that's equal to, that's the difference between impedances of the two mediums divided by the sum of the impedances of the two mediums. We can actually have a Doppler machine to measure the speed of blood that goes through your veins and arteries. So we have Doppler shift is equal to two times the speed cos theta. We have to take that into account, don't we? Divided by the speed of the sound that we're using. Finally, x-ray attenuation. Attenuation just means a decrease in intensity as it travels through a medium, we have the intensity is equal to the original intensity times e to the minus mu x, where this is attenuation coefficient, just a constant for a certain material. And of course, it has to have the units meters to the minus one if it's next to distance, which is meters. So that's almost all of the equations that you're going to come across in your A-level physics exams. If you think that I've missed any and you think they should be included here, then please add in a comment down below. And if you have any questions as to where to find my videos that go into these concepts in greater detail and more depth, then put that in a comment below as well. Please like the video if you found this helpful and I'll see you next time.